Yeah, I will have my topic, which I've been concerned about for also a number of years. Uh, I've dedicated quite a bit of time to researching this topic, and if I presented a talk on this as a distinguished economic botanist lecture at Kew Gardens in, I think it was 2006, and the background information that you require to be able to delve into this uh, topic uh, more deeply can be found on my website at academia.edu. And I'm proud to say that even though that hasn't been published, it's the most hit article that I've ever produced, or the most, uh, the, the top, the, the paper, monograph, or whatever that I've ever produced that has the most hits, is that one. So um, I'm going to a little bit presume that you've got some of the knowledge there, or you'll chase it down. Uh, but I think that what I want to talk about has implications for every one of you, unless you work exclusively in a lab. Um, and that has to do with gender bias and ethnobotany. There was a wonderful book uh, written by a historian named Anne Steer. She actually won an International History Prize for this book. And it looks at uh, gender bias and botany. And she goes back and starts with Carlos von Linnaeus and the sexual relations of plants and the ways in which the uh, sexual mores of Victorian uh, uh, England and Victorian Europe uh, tended to influence Linnaeus's way of understanding the plant world and his way of classifying plants. Um, and all the way through to John Lindley, the first uh, botanist appointed in the UK, uh, who, by the way, was uh, looking to reform the Linnaean system with a, a European system, um, but who considered that uh, botany had to be taken out of the sphere of ladies and put into a firm scientific basis. Um, anyway, uh, that's not my topic. What I did do is I edited a book in 2004 called Women in Plants, Gender Relations and Biodiversity uh, Management and Conservation. Uh, this was a book that was intended to put the question of gender and the plant world firmly on a scientific basis. Um, in it, what I tried to argue was that uh, four propositions, women manage the majority of useful, useful plant species across the planet. If we were actually able to have a database that indicates where the knowledge and uh, majority of knowledge are used lies about the majority of species, I would argue that we would find that uh, the majority lay with women rather than uh, what was probably thought uh, popularly up to the time or scientifically. That also, the plant knowledge and use is everywhere gender differentiated. That doesn't mean that men and women don't know about similar plants or the same plants, but that more specialist knowledge is, generally speaking, quite gender differentiated. Uh, that gender bias in sciences like ethnobotany and ethnobiology is pervasive. Gender bias is related to our cultural cognitive models, our own understandings and ideas about what men and women are about, about gender divisions of labor, about appropriate behavior for men and women, and that permeates the work that we do as scientists. It's extremely difficult to separate ourselves from our own cultural beliefs and biases and to do our science uh, as objective uh, entities that are uh, related to a culture or a period in time. That gender bias also leads to distorted science, and that's where you should be most concerned. This isn't a feminist issue. It's an issue of distorted ethnobotany. Um, and you could say that is a feminist issue, but I'll leave that up to your own political inclinations. Gender bias and ethnobotany, I argue, and I document, show case studies in the paper, um, leads to three serious errors in ethnobotany. One is an error of omission, and that is if we fail to collect our data about knowledge and uses from both men and women, we will be omitting knowledge and uses. We will be omitting plants. Um, an error also of unreliability. If we ask the wrong person about the uh, plant identification or plant uses, for example, uh, then we will be getting unreliable information. And then the third is a little bit uh, more difficult to wrap our heads around, and that is an error of interpretation. And that is, how do we understand people-plant relationships? I'd like to give a bit of an example about that that comes from a long uh, period of research on Andean agrobiodiversity. Uh, Carl Zimmer has done probably the most complex and complete research on Andean agrobiodiversity uh, in, in, in uh, known. Uh, and published his PhD dissertation in 1991 after doing about seven years of research uh, on potato and maize diversity in the Andes. And what he documented for the first time was that women's knowledge of potato and maize diversity compared with men's is 
uh, much more uh, accurate, uh, that women are able to apply more names, and part of the reason that they have better knowledge uh, uh, about uh, maize and potato diversity is that they know more about the culinary aspects of distinguished varieties. So environment um, and, and, and genotype uh, can help to explain about 30% of the variation in the varieties, but it's culinary uses that explains probably about 70%. Um, now, Brush, uh, Stephen Brush, everybody probably knows about Stephen Brush and others like Marie Jean uh did research in 1992, for example, on genetic erosion of maize and, and potato varieties in the Andes, and they started out with a few hypotheses. For example, they hypothesized that men out might great to work from the Andes, their income could be used to encourage agrobiodiversity. But on the other hand, on the, on, the, uh, on the side to erode it, men can't substitute their own expert labor in varietal selection, so therefore diversity could decrease with marrow outmigration. Their findings in this article were that off-farm work did lead to less diversity, and they explained that by saying that farmers traded off income for diversity. But when Carl Zimmerer did uh, more comprehensive research uh, and less gender biased in the same areas of the Andes, what he found was this was not the case because it's women, after all, that have the majority of expertise in selection. However, he found that men's outmigration was leading to pressure on women's time, and therefore women were reducing the number of varieties that they were managing. And the gender gap in knowledge between men and women about varieties was increasing with male outmigration. So his work served to do an awful lot to correct gender bias, but that gender bias was having major implications for the work of uh, places like the Centro Internacional de Papa for the first for SIP. Um, now, that is a problem of error of interpretation. What is going on? Why is diversity decreasing in this case? Um, another, uh, if, we, if we look ever since at least James Bolster's work on the Agua Runa, uh, and I would argue as a sociologist a lot earlier than that, there has been an awful lot available to us to understand about intercultural variation. And what he argued was that knowledge distribution reflects social structures. Variation in knowledge and in uses can be explained by factors that reflect differential knowledge. And age is one factor, sex roles is another factor, opportunities that people have to learn. Gender studies and gender and ethnobotany and ethnobiology research have been adding to this, to Boster's work, to demonstrate very clearly the pervasiveness of gender knowledge, gender divisions of labor, motivation, preferences, uses of space. Most of you are aware of Pfeiffer and Butz's article published in the Journal of Ethnobiology that shows very clearly why it is that men and women would have uh, gender differentiated use and knowledge. Um, the re the re kind of review work that I've been doing for uh, almost two decades generally shows that women are managing more plant diversity compared to men, and that simply has to do uh, with typical gender divisions of labor. For example, if you look at anthropological databases of gathering, hunting and gathering, they show fairly clear that women are responsible for the majority of gathering, of plant gathering, in most societies uh, across the world. Why that is is another discussion. Um, now, what I've been doing since uh, I did this work for, for the Q lecture uh, was I've been examining Scopus uh, database on economic botany and ethnobotany. And I've been looking for likely candidates in terms of citations. And so what I've done is I found, for example, in economic botany, there are 40,000 citations. Uh, ethnobotany uh, will produce 10,000 hits. Um, what I tried to do was narrow that down and say, okay, I'm interested in any citation that deals with knowledge and use, or uses of plants. That kind of uh, citation should be, theoretically, uh, we should be able to uh, indicate who the informants are by sex, as an example. Um, in that, this is just uh, showing that there's quite a bit more uh, citations from ethnobotany that deal with knowledge and uses compared to economic botany. So what I did was focus in on those citations on ethnobotany in that contains knowledge and uses. And if I do that, and then I look at which ones have uh, women or gender as a, as a term in any field uh, in, in the citation, then I end up by subject area with this kind of a graph. The total number of citations, it's agricultural and biology that have the largest quantitative number of citations where women or gender is mentioned. Uh, whereas environmental sciences is least, 
medicine, pharma, uh, pharmacology, et cetera, but it's still a fairly small proportion that mentions either of those terms anywhere uh, in the citation. Um, if I look at that over time, this is kind of a, 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 an area of quite a bit of concern because the number of citations dealing with ethnobotany, knowledge and uses, has obviously been climbing very considerably over time, which is very positive. The number that are dealing with women or gender anywhere in the citation is also increasing, but the gap is growing here. So that says, wait, we better look a little bit further because we should be getting better at this and not worse in terms of looking at intercultural variation. Um, I'm going to skip a few things. Um, what I did was I looked at 93 citations in the Journal of Economic Botany over time uh, from 1968 to 2013 to look at what is the treatment in those citations that mention women or gender anywhere. What is the treatment of women or gender that are in the citations? Well, first of all, I found that actually 22% don't really treat women or gender anywhere. For some reason, they got maybe it's because the institute was an institute of women something or other. Um, on the other hand, I uh, would indicate that at least 4% are actually gender blind, where they should be clearly a reference or paying attention to, the, to, to gender dimension it wasn't. About 5% were very likely gender biased, uh, so there was a clear indication that they got something wrong. Um, another word, there were only anecdotes about women. There was not any indication that they actually interviewed women. Um, in 16 17% of the cases, there was an indication that there was gender disaggregated data collected, but it was never analyzed. So it said so many women were interviewed, so many men were interviewed, but then it got lost. There was nothing done with that. Um, in 13%, there was data that was disaggregated and some analysis of that disaggregation. Um, 12%, the topic was inherently female. Only women are basket makers, for example. So uh, that was why only women were interviewed and there was a, it was a women-sensitive topic. 10% was specifically about women or gender issues and 13% could be considered very gender-sensitive. So that it was looking at the importance of gender as something that helps to understand the differentiation, distribution of knowledge, the distribution or type of uses, et cetera. Um, I looked at, also took uh, economic botany 2004. I said I want to focus in on one fairly recent uh, issue of the Journal of Economic Botany and look at how it's dealing with gender in 2004. When you had the maximum of ethnobotany sites of any year, and there I found that women or gender appeared in five documents, or 11%, two of which were strong, Benigayin and Sesame Domestication, and another one on share fruit, two of which were middling, which did indicate that there was some attention to gender in relation to knowledge erosion, and one was weak. So there were women informants, but there was nothing done with it in the article. But among those without women or gender is a keyword, two of them were actually women only. They weren't picked up by the keywords. Uh, two were likely gender biased in that year, and I discuss here a little bit the reason. I don't think I have time right now to go into it. Uh, and there were three, for example, in Turkey, where the data that were presented were gender disaggregated, but it was underexploited. For example, it would talk about old and, uh, old and young, rich and poor women, and then but giving no breakdown about medicinal plant knowledge or use, how that knowledge was distributed, or whether, for example, gender had any influence at all on the distribution of medicinal plant knowledge, whether it was significant or insignificant. Um, in three articles in 2004, there was simply no way of knowing uh, whether women or men were interviewed, who was interviewed, because it would talk about households being interviewed, for example, or it would talk about old people being interviewed. Um, so we didn't know, we have no way of telling if there was any gender bias implicit. Two of the articles were men only, appropriately men only, and uh, in four, gender was largely irrelevant to the topic. For example, archaeological studies, where it's not possible to know. The question I went into this with this was, how, are we doing any better now that we're supposedly more sensitized to the fact that gender bias has been pervasive in the botanical sciences? that it has affected negatively objectivity, reliability, and interpretation within the science. 
Is it getting better? Is it changing? Is it changing rapidly or not over time? And my tendency is to suggest that yes, there is more sophisticated work out there now than there was uh, some years ago, definitely. Uh, but that proportionately, unfortunately, we're not doing very much to overcome it. Thank you. First of all, we have to thank Patricia. She had so much and was afraid she was going to go over and made it, nailed it under time. So we have time for questions. Oh, no. But when I go over that manually, what I'm noting is that actually um, there seems to be a, a geographical influence. So for example, African researchers tend to do a better job of picking up women than non-African researchers, even if those African researchers are male, even when those African researchers are male. The Pakistan Journal of Botany is doing a better job than the Brazilian Journal of Botany is doing a better job than North American journals if you look at the data on when women or gender are being included, which is, can be fairly superficial. I would like to say that the presence of women in a discipline means that gender bias reduces, but no, I do not believe it does. Not in, not in and of itself. I think women can very often be the ones who are uh, a little bit concerned about being associated with women's issues, and perhaps uh, therefore can be a little bit hesitant. But hopefully there should be an influence on all ethnobotanists as they become increasingly aware of intercultural variation and cultural issues in botany. Thank you very much. Thank you.